So let's get started. So I'm a Dr. Tiffany Keenan. I am a family physician, a functional medicine physician, and a nutritionist. So I have been a physician now for 26 years, and I studied nutrition prior to that to give me a good background um, when I knew that I would need that for family practice. Um, and so tonight we're going to be talking about menopause and weight gain. So for those that have been watching, you know over the past week that I've actually been doing a series on, on menopause, um, talking a little bit about fitness and nutrition. Um, so whatever your questions are tonight, I'm going to be here to answer them for you. But I wanted to begin by just starting with some of the biggest concerns that I have noticed that I've come out with um, my patients. So one of the things that I posted today when it comes to menopause and weight gain is the fact that we need the old myth of eat less, move more. Well, generally that doesn't work in practice, even if you are menopausal or perimenopausal, but we definitely know that when it comes to our perimenopause time, that is not working. So what are we, the biggest things that I see with women is that you need to eat more and lift more. And we'll talk a little bit about that, okay? So as you go through the menopause and perimenopause, one of the first things to notice is when does your weight gain happen? And a lot of women think that they have to wait until the menopause. So what is menopause? Menopause is that point in time, it's a year after you lost your period. So a lot of times you're waiting around thinking, okay, I've got these irregular cycles, things aren't... Um, but I have to wait till I'm done before I can do anything about it. And so that's one of the first myths that you need to learn. And also when it comes to weight gain, the majority of the weight gain actually happens about one to two years before your last menstrual cycle. So you could be now just in your 40s at any point and be starting to notice this gain. So the average age for menopause is about 52, 53. But perimenopause can start up to 10 years before that. So for me, uh, perimenopause started when I was 41, that I noted, at least my first hot flashes, and then I actually had menopause at age 49. So anytime that you're in those 40s, you could be going through perimenopause, and that's when the changes and everything start. And weight gain is one of those things that you start to notice, okay? So you don't have to wait till you're done your cycles to begin worrying about it, so really, no matter what age you are here tonight, I hope that you're going to get some, um, some benefit from this talk that we're going to have and the Q&A. So you need to start paying attention early on. So perimenopause during this time. So why do I say one of the biggest myths is that you need to eat more? So as we go into the menopause transition, and what I mean by that is that time, you know, from our 40s until we go through menopause, because some women will be as late as 55 when they have their last cycle. So over those 10 plus years, things are going to begin to change. And one of the key things that starts to change is the way that our body starts to process carbohydrates or sugars and starches. So as you go through menopause, we know the risk of prediabetes and diabetes and insulin resistance starts to go up. That's very clear across the board. And um, according to some of the posts, I know some people weren't aware of that, that this change can happen. But as the change happened, a few things go on in your body. So you might have been eating the same thing. So a lot of women come to my office, they're like, you know, Dr. Keenan, I've been eating the same thing, doing the same exercise, but still I'm starting to gain weight. And that's because your body is not processing sugar the same way that it did before. So one of the first things we have to look at is the type of carbohydrates that we're eating. So we really want to focus on whole carbohydrates during um, this menopause transition. And also, because we're not processing them as well, what's going to happen is we do have a tendency to store more things as fat. So the first thing that most women will want to do when they gain weight is you're going to start to cut down. And what do you do? You start cutting down on everything. But when you do that, you actually are cutting some of your macronutrients. So let me talk about macronutrients. So to survive, we need protein and we need fat. And we actually don't need carbohydrates. We can make them from our body. But generally, carbohydrates are one of our macronutrient groups. Okay, so protein, carbs and fat. So when you start to gain weight, the first thing you're going to do is you're going to cut down on everything. And one of those key things that you cut down on is protein. 
So as you age, you need to begin thinking about protein, which maybe when you're younger, you don't think about it that much. You maybe eat a steak, a piece of chicken, maybe a little bit of yogurt, but that is not going to work for you as you go through the menopause transition. So why doesn't it work? Because estrogen and progesterone are going down. When they go down, your body is not able, it starts to lose muscle because estrogen has a key role to play in making our muscles strong. So when estrogen and progesterone go down, your muscle mass is actually going to go down. So to maintain muscle mass, we need protein. And it, in some ways, it seems counterintuitive. And I was thinking about this today, you know, because we know that eating fat doesn't make you fat. But you know something, eating protein makes you strong. It really does. So why is protein important? So protein contains essential amino acids. So they're called essential because we need them and we have to get them from food. That's why we need to have protein in our diet. And as we age, the amount of essential amino acids we need, it goes up. We need to actually eat more of them to try to maintain that muscle mass, along with exercise, which we can talk about in a minute. But you need to eat more protein. So what does that look like? Now, most people that come in to see me, and I was reviewing actually a blood sugar um, response curve of someone today, and I was like, I'm gonna make the recommendations that she needs to eat a lot more protein. Because most women that I see, they're getting a little bowl of cereal for breakfast. Maybe they're having a bit of milk with that, which is a little bit of protein. For lunch, maybe they'll have a salad with some chicken breast. Again, a little bit of protein. And then for dinner, they're having some vegetables, maybe a piece of steak or a piece of fish. But that's very low in protein. So as you go through this transition, if you're struggling with your weight, you need to look at how much protein that you're eating. Now, there's a lot of information about there, how much protein we need. When I went to nutrition school, uh, we were told we needed 0.8 grams per kilogram, but we know that that is only the bare minimum. So most of you are going to need between 1.2 and 2.2 grams of, uh, per kilogram of protein per day. So there's a wide range there, and that's going to depend on your exercise status. So if you're a high-end athlete, you need to eat at that high end. So that means you're going to the gym five days a week, you're doing CrossFit, um, or you're doing a lot of endurance running. So 2.2 grams per kilo of protein is basically a gram per pound. So a 150-pound woman that's going to the gym five days a week, she needs about 150 grams of protein. That's quite a bit, right? But say if you're um, a smaller woman like me, I'm petite, I have a small frame, you know, I weigh about 120 um, I exercise not intensely, um, but I do my, my strength, I do my cardio, I aim for closer to 1.4 grams. So for me, that's about 70 to 80 grams of protein a day. And most of you are actually should be within that range. And I know from seeing patients that you're not in that range because we are not prioritizing protein when it comes to our nutrition. And again, it seems counterintuitive, but I want you to challenge yourself, okay? So first is look at how much protein that you're eating. So the general rule for protein is that you want to have protein the size of the palm of your hand, okay? Not all your fingers, but the palm of your hand and as thick as the palm of your hand. You're going to want to try to get about 30, 20 to 30 grams of protein for each meal, so if you want to go a little bit further to calculate how much protein you're getting, then a lot of you I know are using fitness trackers. So some people are probably using MyFitnessPal. That's a great one to use. Um, some people might use Diet Doctor. It's a tracking app. Some people might use Chronometer. But what you can do is go online and figure out how much protein you're getting. Or if you say, Dr. Keenan, I am not, I know I'm not getting it, then you have to start to add those sources back in. So protein number one. And you and one of the other things with protein is you want to make sure you're getting regular boost of it throughout the day. So I see a few of you out there that I know are more into fitness training and I do a lot of strength training. So there's a few key times that you want to get your protein in. And I know you might ask questions about this after, but a key time is at breakfast. Why is breakfast key? So breakfast, you are breaking your fast, right? An overnight fast. But when the studies have shown when you get a high amount of protein 
as your morning meal, and we're talking 25 to 30 grams of protein. It keeps you full longer during the rest of the day. It reduces your food cravings, and it actually reduces um, your, your blood sugar because of its protein's response on insulin. So getting your protein first thing in the morning can be great. Now, 25 to 30 grams of protein, what does that look like in the morning? If you're talking eggs, then you're eating about five eggs, okay? Because an egg has about six grams of protein. So some of you might say, wow, that's kind of crazy, Dr. Keenan. But you can have three eggs, and then you can top it maybe with a little yogurt on the side. You can have some berries, or sorry, you can have some nuts, because that's gonna increase your protein requirement. Or maybe what you want to do is have some eggs and have a shake with it. But you need to think about getting your protein in the morning. The other key time about getting protein is after you exercise. So those of you that are going, you're hitting the gym. So really, if you're doing some type of strength-based training, what happens after you exercise, the muscle is, think about it, it's hot. You know, you've been at the gym, you've been sweating. The muscle's really receptive to protein. So that's another key time to get your protein. And then, of course, it's going to be hard to eat a bunch of eggs. So what you're going to want to do at that time is think about having a protein shake. Now, personally, I'm not a big fan of shakes, but over the past month, I've brought shakes back into my life because I know for me, it's just harder to get that full amount of protein. And optimally, you want to get it within about 30 minutes or to 60 minutes after you've had your workout. Because what's gonna happen, that protein's gonna go in the way that it's gonna work to your muscles. Because remember, as you're going through menopause, you have less estrogen in your muscles. So you need to have something to help the muscle build up to get stronger. And that's where the protein is gonna come in. Okay, so prioritizing your protein. And then you'll have your other, you know, two meals throughout the day. Try to have, again, 25 to 30 grams of protein. And then you wanna have protein at your snacks. Now, the other thing is the source of protein that you're having. And this is not a full nutrition talk, but we do know that animal sources of protein in general are more complete sources of protein. So remember I said that proteins were essential amino acids. So those essential amino acids are best to get from animal sources. You can get them from plant sources, but often you have to combine like rice and beans to get it. Uh, now, there was a question today about hemp hearts because someone's, because I posted that I really love hemp hearts, but hemp hearts are actually a complete source of protein that is plant-based. So that may be something that you want to add to your meals. Okay, so you're going to get um, protein, animal-based is going to have more of those essential amino acids, but you can get it through plant-based sources as well. You still just need to watch it. The other key thing for those that are really into fitness is you want to get a source of leucine. So leucine is an essential amino acid, um, and it's really important, again, for protein muscle synthesis. And that's where branched chain amino acids, or BCAAs, come in. So a lot of people might take their BCAAs pre-workout or post-workout, but either way, you want to get those essential amino acids in. So I'm spending a lot of time on protein because I think it's the greatest problem that women have when it comes to um, the menopause transition when they're trying to lose weight. And then let's talk a little bit about carbs because that's another big nutrition question. So what do you do? So I said as you go through uh, menopause that you're not going to process carbs the way that you did before. So when you were young, you could have the fast food, you could have takeout once in a while, but as you're getting older, you really have to look for whole carbs. So what does that mean? Real food, food that doesn't come from a box. So it can be a combination, right? It can be a fruits, it can be, um, of course, it can be lots and lots of veggies that you wanna have. You can have your whole grains, but you have to watch in terms of your overall carbohydrate content. Now, for those of you that I know are familiar with a ketogenic diet, where I'm not talking in the ketogenic range, you know, of 50 grams, that's a whole other conversation, but you wanna keep your carbs probably like 100 to 125 grams. And of course, you're gonna to wanna to have, if you have whole carbs, you're also getting lots of protein with it. Okay, so we talked about protein, we talked about carbs, and then I wanna talk a little bit about fats. So the fats, of course, that we're talking about, we want, again, healthy fats. So we're talking olive oil, uh, we're talking the healthy fats that can come from meat, uh, the healthy fats that you can get from yogurt, and I'm a fan of having a, a whole fat yogurt or maybe a 2% yogurt, um, because if you're gonna eat it, 
and you're paying for it these days, have a little bit of fat. There's nothing wrong with that milk-based uh, fat that you can be having. But we want to look, avoid, of course, the deep fried fats, the trans fats. Um, we want to stay away from those sorts of things. So protein, fats, and carbs. So what are the other, from a nutrient perspective, I wanted to talk about two other things. So one is fiber. So fiber is super protective as we go through menopause and the transition, well, at any point in our lives. But fiber is a source of a prebiotic. So what is a prebiotic? So in our gut, which is super important, and we'll talk about when we come to a question that someone had, in our gut, we need a combination of prebiotics things like fiber and polyphenols, which I'll talk about, and we need probiotics. So we've all heard of probiotics before. These are things like sauerkraut, um, sauerkraut, um, kombucha, you know, uh, yogurt, of course, those are probiotic, kimchi. Those are probiotic foods, but the prebiotics, we often forget, but they're super important for us. So some of the greatest sources of prebiotics are what we call polyphenols. Now, you may not have heard that word before, or maybe you did. Some people might be taking a polyphenol supplement. But what polyphenols are, think of them as, again, they're prebiotic, so they're part of all this gut bacteria. And when we eat more of them, it helps our gut to get in a more healthy state. Because as we go through menopause, the, we will begin to have more and more issues with our gut as our estrogen and progesterone drop. So what does that mean? That women that go through menopause can often have more cases of irritable bowel syndrome because of the drop of estrogen and progesterone. So you may be wondering that's what's going on with your gut. So how do we get these polyphenols? So polyphenols are some of those really um, fruits that have really a lot of color to them. And you probably heard of blueberries before, right? We kind of know about that of the antioxidant amount of blueberries, but also we're looking at other types of fruits like blackberries, you know, tart cherries. They have high amounts of polyphenols. But the other one that's super high is cacao. So cacao is cocoa, okay? So cocoa powder. Now, some of you might be thinking, is she gonna tell me to drink hot chocolate? Well, actually it wouldn't be so bad <laughs> if you were to drink hot chocolate, but what I'd prefer you to have is to get raw cacao. And because raw cacao is, has a higher level of antioxidants, especially if you get a, an organic type of raw cacao. And then actually I make it, some people will have um, a cacao with some type of milk. I like to have it with coconut milk. It's very rich and creamy, and plus coconut milk is good for you as well. And you can have that as a hot shake. So cacao can be good for you. Dark chocolate can be good for you, right? Olives are good for you. And then when it, coffee and tea. So you often hear that, of course, green tea is, is healthy for me. It's because it has polyphenols. Coffee has polyphenols. So these things are good for you. So it really comes to variety. So if you think about poly, it means multi, but we're looking at multiple types of nutrients. So the other big sources are the nuts and seeds that we spoke about. And actually there was a research study done looking at walnuts. Now, if you ever look at a walnut, a walnut looks like a little brain, but a walnut is a really good source of healthy fats, um, monounsaturated fatty acids, and also it's a healthy source of polyphenols. So getting more nuts into your diet. Spices, things like cloves, curry, turmeric, right? So turmeric, a lot of you might have heard of turmeric or curcumin, which is basically turmeric that's been put into a little capsule. Curcumin is really good for us. It's really, it's good for our gut, it's good for our brains, it's for, good for inflammation, but also it's one of these polyphenols. We also have the things like hemp hearts that I spoke about before, and we have things like ground flax seeds, so they're a good sources of polyphenols. So I think that's what I wanted to talk about from nutrition. So if you have any nutrition questions, you could start to post those, um, because I think I'm going to go on, oh, before I be, we leave nutrition, okay, let's talk about intermittent fasting. Okay, because I know that many of you, when you submitted your questions, so many of you are intermittent fasting. So what I want you to know is as you go through your transition, what worked for you at 35 may not work for you at 45 or 50. So intermittent fasting, if you're not familiar with it, it's basically eating in a specific window. 
And one of the most common windows that I recommend is what we call a 16-8 fast. So this means you eat in an eight hour window and you don't eat for the rest of the 16 hours. So what does that look like? So you eat between eight to four, nine to five, 10 to six, and you don't eat the rest of the day. So we know that when you eat in a more narrow window, it's gonna help with insulin resistance, like the diabetes, the way you process your blood sugar. It's gonna help um, get rid of some of the visceral fat in your body. So as we gain weight, as we get older, often it goes more to our belly instead of on our hips. So intermittent fasting can help with that as well. There can be other patterns. Some women will go as short as a four hour window, which I don't really recommend for most women because it's really hard to get all your nutrient needs. Remember protein, it's hard to eat, you know, 80, 90 grams of protein in only four hours. So, um, looking at the window that you're using can be very beneficial. And if you've never tried intermittent fasting before, one of the things that you can start with is even a wider window. Even if you start with 12 hours, okay? And you say, I'm gonna eat between seven and seven, and I'm not gonna eat any of the rest of the time. Now, you're not gonna go wild and crazy between seven and seven. You still wanna eat healthy food, but during those other 12 hours, so from 7 p.m. until seven the next morning, you're not gonna eat at all. Now, there can be lots of different strategies for ways that we can use intermittent fasting um, as another, we can do different strategies. There's a product called Prolon, which I've done before, which is called the Fasting Mimicking Diet. It's a way that you can fast with food, and we know that Prolon has studied that it's been able to, review, um, to reduce insulin resistance and diabetes, and it has very protective effects on the body. It actually can promote longevity. So we know there's lots and lots of benefits of fasting, but when you're in this time period, the one caution I would say is, are you getting enough food? So for those of you that are wondering, I've been fasting for a while and I can't lose the weight, then I want you maybe to start thinking about having breakfast and getting enough protein. Even if you try that for a couple of weeks, see if you're gonna shake your body up a little bit. The other thing during the menopause transition is we do need to sometimes shake our bodies up. So say you're doing fasting five days a week and maybe you're in an eight hour window, then give yourself like maybe a Saturday or a Sunday, give yourself the chance to eat a little bit more fun and break it up a little bit because the body does need a little bit of shaking up from time to time. Um, Intermittent fasting, nutrition, we spoke about that. So when it comes to, oh, just hopefully my phone is gonna last for the rest of this. Um, the other thing that we'll start talking about as we, and then I'll answer some of the questions was the fitness that you need to do, right? And I reviewed all through that this week, but the overall fitness for those that didn't listen or weren't able to listen is that one of the things that I see so much I get two ends of the extreme, okay, in my menopause patients. So I get some that are following every rule by the book, they're doing spin class, they're going to hit, they're going to Zumba, they're sweating it out, they are overtraining. This is one thing to think about. When you go through the transition, when you overtrain, what happens is it stresses out your body, it raises your cortisol, and then you can often lose your muscle mass because most of these women that I see that are training a lot, they're not getting enough protein because they're worried about eating food. So if you wanna keep training like that, you really need to get your nutrient requirements up. Dr. Stacy Sims, she's an exercise physiologist. She's written a book just about this. So if you're an intense athlete, you have to be really smart when it comes to the menopause. But then I see some women as well that you know, they kind of go to yoga class once in a while. They like to go for a gentle walk and then they're wondering why they're putting on five, 10 or 20 pounds, you know, when it comes to menopause. Because the other thing that you need to do, so you need to lift weights. Just as all those things I spoke about with protein, as you go through this menopause transition, if you are gonna lose your muscle, I saw that myself, my muscle started going down, I was getting jiggly thighs that I didn't have before and I needed to hit the weights. When you hit the weights, you need to start off, you know, hopefully you can maybe get a trainer or go to the gym to get someone to show you how to do this. But what you wanna do eventually is you wanna do weights, you wanna do few repetitions, but you want to lift heavy. So this is something that goes against what we've all thought, 
you know, I want to do 12 to 15 reps. No, no, no. When you're going through menopause, you want to do maybe six to eight reps. So you need to get yourself up to that stage. So you want to do weight training two to three times a week, a couple of sets, but only six to eight reps. So you need to start lifting heavy. Maybe you say, I don't have weights. I can't go to the gym. Well, there's all kinds of body strength exercises. You know, push-ups, sit-ups, squats. These are great things that you can do at home. And it doesn't take you long before you start to burn out on squats. I can tell you that. So you need to do your weights. You need to cut back a little bit on your cardio. So those are some of the key points when it comes to cardio and your weight loss. Um, and the other thing is to build in what we call um, exercise snacks. So there's been studies done that look at people that do go to the gym, they go for you know 45 minutes or they go for a run, but then they sit the rest of the day. Well, what happens? They've done a study and they put um, someone that was getting up every hour, they were doing five minutes of exercise versus somebody that went to the gym and did it like, you know, a cardio. The person that got up every hour did better. And that's because we need to activate our muscles during the day. So we call these exercise snacks. So what does it mean? Basically, you just get up and move around. It's the easiest thing that you can do. Even if you say, okay, Dr. Keenan, I can't go to the gym. I'm not going to do that. I can't strength train. But I will encourage you to set, if you're going to sit down, watch TV. If you're going to be on your computer, set a timer for 45 or, or 60 minutes and then get up. Do some squats. Do some um walking lunges, do some a toe tip exercises, go against the wall when you're brushing your teeth. Um, any little time that you can add in an exercise snack during the day is going to be better for you, okay? Because we know all of the poor outcomes when we lose our muscle as we age. And it, then it doesn't even come about weight, okay? We know that you're going to get sick because what's correlated with you living a long, healthy life Number one, it's your VO2 max, and we'll talk about that soon uh, because I have a device that can measure that to really get you in a healthy zone. But it's the amount of skeletal muscle mass you are. It's how strong you are. That is going to help you live longer, and you're going to run into less problems with a lot of diseases when you stay strong and you stay mobile. All right, so we've got cardio, we've got strength, we've got intermittent fasting, we've got nutrition that we spoke about. Um, and the other thing I want to talk about is just a little bit about your weight and body composition, because I know there's some people here from Miramichi that have might have been uh, up to the pound, maybe and had a body uh, fat assessment done. This can be a really beneficial thing to start with if you're going to start an exercise and nutrition program. And I like to do this with my patients, because many times you might have heard the word skinny fat. <laughs> and what this means is you can be tiny, but you can have a lot of visceral fat. So visceral fat is the fat within our organs. And this fat is very dangerous. It's when you have more visceral fat, then you're going to be much more likely to have pro problems with insulin resistance and run into problems with prediabetes. So when you have a body fat analysis done, um, in particular, the in-body scan, it can tell you where you're holding on to fat in your body and also where you need, where your muscle mass is. So if you're working with a good um, personal trainer, they can actually help you target certain areas to build up your muscle mass. But for most of you, we want to, you know, the greatest muscle mass, of course, we have is in our legs, and that's a great area to get started. But it's just another little tool if you're looking for some type of encouragement to get that scan done. If you can't get the scan done, then stepping on the scale may not also be the best way because one, we don't know where this fat is coming from. So another way that you can measure is your waist to hip ratio. So basically taking a measuring tape around the biggest point of your hips, the smallest point of your waist, and it should be less than 0.8 because that means that you have a little bit more of a curve, but it means that you have less visceral fat because we know during uh, perim the whole menopause transition, fatty liver disease goes up. It's much more increased during, um, during this time. So we need to think about if you're having that visceral fat, are you going to be developing fatty liver disease? And then how are you going to overcome it? Um, the watches. Thanks, uh, Gladys. Yeah, I'm not sure if he has the machine. I'm going to check with him uh, next week when I'm back in Miramichi. 
The watches are not as beneficial, okay? Definitely body impedance when you're standing on a scale is a much better measurement. The optimal measurement is a DEXA scan, but there's none of those um, in New Brunswick. So I would, and there's also the handheld scans that you can do. Some people will have a scale at their house, and I used to have an Omni scale, and it can be beneficial because it's, you can standardize it to yourself. So you can get on the scale the same time each day. Um, but I haven't really looked that closely at the watches, but um, I would think if it's just on your arm, it's not gonna give you as good a membership, uh, a measurement. And thanks, Peggy. Yes, I know, so Peggy's my new star. <laughs> She's doing exercise snacks throughout the day, and it is fun, and you know, it can actually get your family involved too. That can be fun with exercise snacks. Okay. Okay, so exercise. Um, so your measurements. So that's where I was starting, that get your measurements, know where you are, because you also, it's great to have a little bit of accountability so you can see what happened and then what do I need to do. So I want to get into some of the questions that were asked um, earlier because it links into something else for us to discuss. So one is, why do I bloat so much during this time? So what, why is all the bloating happening? So one of the things that happens earlier on in your menopause is that the first thing that will drop is progesterone. So our major hormones are estrogen and progesterone. So progesterone drops first, and so what happens? Well, first we can start to have trouble sleeping, we can start to develop muscle aches and pain, and we can start to retain fluid because progesterone is a natural diuretic. It actually helps, it has a, uh, works through the kidneys because you know these little receptors, these hormones, they don't just work in our ovaries. They work all over our body. And actually there's a um, discussion now to try to change them from calling them sex steroid hormones because we have, hair, we have receptors all over our body. So when you start to lack progesterone, then you can start to become bloated. So this is why one of the things I start early on in many of my patients, and I think what most of you need to start early on is progesterone. So it's going to help you with your, if you have any hot flashes, it can help you with your night sweats. And progesterone, we often do it in a cyclic fashion if you're still having your period. So you'll take progesterone for two weeks out of your cycle. So it's the two weeks before your period because it's going to um, boost your natural levels and that's when they um, will get boosted. So that can be one reason that you have low progesterone, so that can be why you start to get bloated. But another reason you might be getting bloated is that you're starting to have more problems with constipation. So remember I said that these hormones start to impact the gut and leaky gut is more common after, uh, as we go through menopause transition. So one, for some women, they start to develop more constipation. And a lot of women come to see me and I always ask, so what are your bowels like and how often do they move? Some women, you may be out there, your bowels need to move every day. If you're only having a bowel movement every three or four days, then you definitely have to get your gut in order. Getting your gut in order is one of the most important things, not only for your hormones, but for the rest of your life, for cancer risk, for everything. You need to get your gut balanced. And you might say, which many women tell me, oh, I've been constipated all my life. Well, that's not normal. <laughs> so it can start really early on, but you need to start thinking about it now or you're gonna run into more and more problems. So, um, and if you're constipated, of course, taking some laxatives, and I tell women that when you start to poop more, you'll lose more weight. And I don't mean laxatives like X-lax, but things um, like magnesium citrate. So magnesium is a really good supplement to take, but also it has uh, a relaxant effect on the bowel. So it can be a great one to get you started. Increasing your fiber, especially things like, um, some people think just about psyllium, like Metamucil, but I actually prefer Inulin. Um, if so, it has a brand name, which I can't remember right now, but you can buy Inulin powder, and it's a much better prebiotic fiber, but it's really good to get your bowels going. But if you're having difficulty as well, good old fashioned things like prune juice, um, but you need to get the bowels moving more regularly. But if that's a problem with constipation, this is a red flag, ladies, okay? It's a red flag, you need to get your gut in better order. So what can you do then to get your gut in better order if that's a problem? So in addition to, we spoke about the polyphenols, remember the cacao, the coffee, the tea, we spoke about uh, prebiotics. 
I didn't get in as much to probiotics. I spoke about probiotic foods, but probiotic supplements can help you as well. Now, I do a lot of gut analysis with my patients, and I know that, and studies show us that as you go from premenopause to postmenopause, the bacteria in your gut change. There's one that I follow quite closely. It's called acromensia. And acromensia has also been shown to be low in diabetics. Acromensia you can buy as a specific probiotic supplement. It can actually help regulate blood sugar, but it can also be very beneficial for your gut bacteria. Um, Acromensia is in some of the products that I've seen in the tr studies that were done for women during um, as I go through menopause transition. So think about a probiotic. Um, in Canada, we don't have Acromensia. The brand name is Pendulum, if you wanted to look it up. Um, but you could try something like Align or a Megaspore Biotic. Megaspore Biotic, you probably need to buy it uh, from Amazon. It's a really good quality uh, probiotic. So that might be something that you may want to consider as well if, you're ba if your bowels aren't working very good, is adding that probiotic. Um, and then another person had asked about, again, the irritable bowel syndrome that that had flared during menopause. So the other thing that we start looking at is when we get down to the gut, digging deeper a little bit, and it's amazing the things that we can measure. Um, when we do the stool analysis test, we can actually measure another enzyme called beta-glucuronidase. If beta-glucuronidase is up, you're going to have much more problems with your estrogen metabolism. So this is really important to know if you are kind of even in the perimenopausal age. So you have polycystic ovarian syndrome. Maybe you've been diagnosed with fibroids. Uh, maybe you're having a lot of heavy menstrual bleeding or been told that you have adenomyosis. Because if you're having those conditions, and if beta-glucuronidase is high, there are actually things that we can give you that can lower beta-glucuronidase in your gut, but can help you with your estrogen metabolism. Some of you probably heard a little bit about estrogen excess or estrogen overdrive. Um, and so there's things that we can give to help overcome that, okay? One of those is calcium deglucurate. Um, it's not something that I think you need to go out there and buy, but these are things I want you to be aware so that you can actually say, what's going to be the best way that I can help to really get my gut and everything back in order? So, but the beta glucuronidase, the only way to test for that is with a stool test. It's not done through hospital testing. It's done through advanced testing uh, that you would have to get done through myself, a functional medicine doctor, or at a, um, a naturopath clinic. Um, someone else brought up the fact that they get a lot of um, leg and ankle swelling as well. And that again comes back to the role that one, that progesterone is a diuretic. And remember, it's going to drop um, during perimenopause. So you want to add, the, you may choose to add progesterone in um, as a, a menopausal hormone therapy. But the other reason that sometimes people get ankle and leg swelling is the amount of processed foods and sodium that they're eating, okay? Because if you're having a lot of processed foods, you're going to hold on to water. So that's another reason to make sure you're, that you're getting a whole foods diet and that you watch the amount of processed foods. And then there was a case that was brought up that I wanted to review a little bit with you. So um, she says, I think just over 60 years old. So she had been on menopausal hormone therapy, she said, by her family physician. And then at 57, I believe it was her... Um, mother that was diagnosed with breast cancer and then she had a, a breast lump when she was in her her younger years 30 years I think and had the lump out so when she got to 60 she said well I don't think there's as much benefit for hormone therapy so I'm gonna stop my HRT and so she stopped her HRT and well guess what happened she was doing really well weight wise and then she put on the belly pouch the little pooch that we get right the lower powder of our belly and so she asked me, you know, what I thought might be going on. So the additional part of the, of the story is that she also has a history of Crohn's. Um, and Crohn's is an inflammatory bowel disease. So what happened? So she went off her HRT. She was on estradiol and progesterone. And she gained weight. So a few things here. So what did I tell her? I kind of said, think about going back on your HRT. So ladies, there is no age that you have to stop hormonal therapy. There was a study released just last month 
and it reviewed over 10 million cases um, of patients in America that were on Medicare. And these women were on menopause therapy after the age of 65. And after the age of 65, menopausal therapy was actually found to be protective of many cases. So menopausal therapy, and I'll specify, with estradiol, okay, transdermal, so that means a patch or estrogel, and progesterone was protective against breast cancer, protective against colon cancer. And of course, it's pro and also protective against heart disease. And of course, we already know it's protective against osteoporosis. So menopausal hormone therapy is safe. Go on, if you're on it, don't worry about stopping it. Uh, you can continue on hormonal therapy for the rest of your life if you're already on it, okay? So that's one thing that I said to her. The other is she noticed more inflammation. So why is that? Because estrogen and progesterone, when they drop, they cause more inflammation in your body. I see a lot of women that are diagnosed with rheumatoid arthritis, with lupus during the menopausal time, and that's because they've lost the anti-inflammatory benefits of estrogen and progesterone. So what does that mean? Maybe you need to think about, do I need estrogen and progesterone to help me? Um, so I hope that answered her question, that she, that she can stay on hormone therapy for a long period of time. Um, and now the other part of the question, she said she did see the naturopath and there was some natural alternatives. And there are natural alternatives. Uh, if you want, if you don't want to try um, hormonal therapy, Early on, uh, I'll just mention a few things that you can try. So if you're early in your 40s, you can try Vitex or Chase Tree. So this will actually boost your natural progesterone and it can help many women. You can also get blends that have a lot of polyphenols. So kind of, you heard about evening primrose oil, it can be helpful, but Promensal, it's sold over the counter. It's a red clover oil. Estrovera is another one. Um, and there can be other supplements, uh, FemGuard HT Plus is another one that can have these natural substances that will help you with menopause transition. But let's talk for just a little minute about the safety of HRT. So tonight was day five of our discussions about weight loss and menopause. And so what do we know about HRT and menopause? Okay, wait, HRT, sorry, and weight loss. So we know estrogen, what does it do in our body? This was a great study. It was actually done in 2022, and I presented it to members of my group. So the, the effects of estrogen, it works in our brain, okay? So estrogen look, works really similar to something called GLP-1. And for those of you, you might even be on it, something called Ozempic. Well, estrogen works in a very similar fashion because of the receptors in the brain. So estradiol actually helps us with our cravings. So that's one of the ways that it works, which is the way that Ozempic works. And the other way that estradiol works, similar to Ozempic, is it helps with satiety. And that makes, means it makes us feel full because it can change your gastric mo motility a little bit. And that's one of the ways that Ozempic works. So in my books, I would much rather be uh, looking at estradiol than Ozempic when it comes to weight loss. And I know a lot of you out there might be thinking, well, I took Ozempic and I lost weight. You may have lost weight. When you start hormonal, uh, menopausal hormone therapy, you're having so many additional benefits beyond the weight and Ozempic is not giving you that, okay? So think about that. The other thing, so when they looked at the studies with um, giving estradiol and progesterone, they were able to see there was less insulin resistance. So um, the study from 2020, the KEEPS trial, which was a large trial, they used topical estradiol and they used cyclical progesterone. They saw less insulin resistance, that means less prediabetes, less blood sugar, and less weight gain, okay? So I want you to consider that as part of your toolkit as well if you're thinking about uh, hormones, whether they could be right for you. Um, I think that was most that I had listed down here. The only other thing that I had spoken about this week was uh, breathing, and I'll put a little plug in for breathing as well. 
um, because we often don't think about breathing. We think it's something so natural that we do, but we actually do know that the breath and the way that we breathe can have huge impacts on our body and on our metabolism and on our stress levels. So I spoke this week in some of the studies that I reviewed, sitting for 10 minutes a day, doing controlled breath. So basically paying attention to your breath in six weeks, you can lose 1.2 pounds. Okay. Now that may not seem a lot, but it's 10 minutes a day to sit and relax and you can use a pound every six weeks. So over the course of the year that you could really help you. Now, I know that's not going to be your primary weight loss tool, but I want just to bring it up because, so that you know the power of the breath. But the other one in the study that I spoke of is that diaphragmatic breathing. So breathing from the belly is very beneficial for uh, improving your resting metabolic rate. So what does that mean? So the resting metabolic rate tells us how many calories you burn when you're doing nothing. So when you breathe from your belly, you can basically eat a, burn less calories. So you can eat a little bit more if you're burning, if you're breathing through your belly. So those are things that I talk about more in my um, menopause course and that we've spoken a little bit more about in my group. So I know I've been talking for a long time and as you can see, there's so much uh, information to give when it comes to the menopause space and I really feel that it's good to have evidence-based medicine which is why I try to reference as much as I can uh, with studies so if there's any other questions please just let me know wonderful and you know breathing through our noses we often it's a bad cycle because what happens is we get allergies and then we start mouth breathing when we start mouth breathing, then actually it puts a lot of strain on our body. Mouth breathing can actually lead to cavities. It can lead to changes in our gut microbiome. Uh, it's not healthy for us. It can lead to more snoring at nighttime. And you can retrain your body to breathe through your nose. So I hope that you're going to be able to do that, Colleen, and that that will help you. Um, the other way to teach yourself how to breathe through your nose is starting by taping your mouth at nighttime. Because in the beginning, it might seem very strange to tape your mouth, but the body actually begins to get used to it. Um, so that's another tip to train yourself. And then there's all kinds of breath techniques. Maybe look up calling alternate nostril breathing. It's a really great technique to open up one nostril at a time and get, your, get you more comfortable with breathing through your nose. And for those of you out there that, as you mentioned about allergies, some of you might have been on antihistamines for years and years and years. So like, you know, Claritin or Allegra, those, they're not good for your body. I want you to know, number one. And if you're actually on them long time, most likely you've already developed some skin issues. You're going to have some gut issues. You might have developed insulin resistance or prediabetes already because it's really affecting your body. So you need to get off antihistamines. And the way to do it is to work with a practitioner that can set you on the right course. Um, okay, so any other questions that you have? And we'll probably be doing more lives and everything like this. So I just wanted to let you know, as we go through this time, you can see I've got a lot of knowledge. I'm 52, I'm postmenopausal, I'm on HRT, and I also, I'm a nutritionist. I've studied this inside and out. And you might say, well, why doesn't my family doctor tell me all these things? Well, we get very little training on this in medical school. I've then, you know, I got my training because I went through it and I study the research because I want to know because I'm a woman, I have a sister and I have nieces and I want to know for them. So all of this knowledge I'm getting is for my, my, me and my family, but for all of you. And I want to share that knowledge with you. For some of you, if you want to get a little bit more help, I did want to let you know, I'm going to be running another, um, Hormones and the Breath Masterclass, and I'm going to be doing that next Saturday, May 25th in Miramichi. So I did the first Masterclass last month, and I can see some of the participants here online. If you're still watching, please put a plug in if you had fun at the Masterclass. So basically, it's a five, a six-hour event that we have. It's going to be held at the Miramichi Naturopath Clinic. And what I do, I do an in-depth um, review of your health history even before you get to the program because I want to know what your background is. The program is limited to 12 participants, and that's because I want to get to know you. So we spend time during the day, we go through um, the protocols that I have, we talk about HRT, the safety of it, 
Um, and then we have lots of fun during that day. We do some breath work as well. And then at the end of the session, we decide, do you need any testing? Do you need hormonal testing? Do you need blood work? Do you need stool testing? Do you need a saliva test? And then, because I know one day is not enough, then we continue for four weeks after. And so for the following four weeks, you get access to me. So my group knows that they can message me and ask me any questions during that four weeks. And then we meet once a month, or sorry, once a week by Zoom. So we have a Zoom call. We usually do a case study. And that's because I want to teach you to get you educated about what to do. And then I help you design your own hormonal plan. Because sometimes even after a day, it's a little confusing about what you, um, what's going on and what's the best path for you to move forward. And that's why the one month is really good. And sorry, um, Elena, I'm not going to be doing one here in Bermuda, sadly. Hopefully in the fall, we'll be able to do one, but nothing through the summer. But keep stay tuned for the fall. So it's a really great day to work with a lot of other women. I can let you know some of what the biggest support, I think, is knowing that you don't have to be alone on this journey. That was a big takeaway. And also knowing that you can overcome these symptoms. There's lifestyle things that you can do. Menopausal hormonal therapy is safe. There's other things that we can do, like getting our gut in balance. You know, there's stress-based things that we can do as well. So if you're interested in the program, um, I would invite you to join me. We still have a few spots left, but I've had a few people register um, because some of my participants that attended, and thank you guys for being here tonight to support me, they've referred a friend because they know how beneficial this information is. You don't need to struggle. You don't need to gain weight like this. You don't need to go on to develop diabetes. And further, you don't want to develop other conditions like osteoporosis, Alzheimer's disease as well. So, um, oh, thank you, Peggy. Ah, uh, hot flashes, weight, osteo, not knowing what to do. Right, thanks, we talk about vitamins. And that's it. Thank you too for your commitment because I think this is what happens. Is, and you're glad your hot flashes are better. And this is just in a couple of weeks, ladies. It doesn't take a lot of time when you know the right things to do. So if you want to join me, so the program, um, I'm gonna send a link later in the Facebook page. And for those of you that registered, I'll send you an email out as well with all the details. So um, there is light at the end of the tunnel. And actually at the other side of the tunnel, just to let you know, once you get through menopause, it's great. You're actually going to feel better than you did before. You're going to be happier and smarter than you have been. It's the transition time that can be really hard. So work with me. Work with a guide that knows what she's doing. I've been there. I've helped others. If you want to join, um, the cost for the event, it's $5.95. That covers your whole day, and that covers the full month follow-up with me and any testing that we have to do. Um, we can get things done at the hospital, or if you have private coverage, we can do additional testing through the naturopath. So any last comments before we head off? It's been an hour. I can't believe it. Thank you all for sticking with it. And that's it. You're not alone. We're a really good supportive community. And uh, over the summer months, just to let you know, too, I'll be running other programs in Miramichi. Um, we'll be doing the VO2 max testing, uh, which is your cardiac based testing. We're going to be doing a healing bowl, a sound therapy, which is a stress reduction workshop. And we will be planning a retreat. Hopefully it'll be a weekend based retreat. Um, so we'll keep you posted on all those things. Thanks so much, ladies. I hope you have an amazing evening. And I want you all to know that we are sisters. We're here to support one another and that along this journey, um, there's going to be times that we do feel really down. We feel like we don't know where we're going, that we need a little bit of direction. But there's always help that direction is here. If you have any questions or comments, please feel free to send me a message. I do try to answer my Facebook and my Instagram messages as well. Have a great night. Take care. Bye-bye.